Hello everybody and welcome to the Igneous Petrology series lesson one. So in this lesson we're going to be looking at the periodic table and Goldschmidt's classification. The image in the background is an image of the Bushveld complex in South Africa. It is the world's largest layered mafic intrusion. So the goal of this series is to build up our knowledge to begin to understand how structures like this form through geological processes. But today we're really going to start with the basics. So the periodic table is a table of the chemical elements ordered by increasing atomic number. The elements can be grouped according to their physical and chemical properties. Physical properties include things like melting point and boiling point, and chemical and properties include things like reactivity and electronegativity. The first recognised version of the periodic table dates back to 1869, where Russian scientist Dmitry Mendeleev ordered 56 known and also eight unknown elements by atomic weight. It's quite an impressive feat. In geoscience, we have other element classification according to their behaviour in geological systems. A widely used geochemical classification is that of the Goldschmidt classification proposed by Victor Goldschmidt in 1922. Now, to understand the periodic table, we should really understand the structure of an atom. Atoms are composed of a nucleus composed of positively charged protons and neutral neutrons, given in red and green there respectively. Now this positively charged nucleus is orbited by negatively charged electrons. Now those electrons are ordered according to their shells, so we have the first shell or K, the second shell or L, the third shell or also known as M, so on so forth. Now, as we delve deeper into the shells, we see that those shells also have subshells, known as S, P, D, and F subshells. Okay? What we should know is that the S subshell has one orbital, and one orbital houses two electrons. Now, if we apply that knowledge to the other subshells, we can learn about how many electrons are hosted within that subshell. So, in the P subshell, we have three orbitals. Multiply that by two, and we have six electrons. D, we have five orbitals. Multiply that by two, and we have ten electrons. And the same then for F, and so on and so forth. Now, we can write the orbitals in this sort of arrangement. This is a diagram you may have seen from chemistry lessons, okay? And it looks a bit intimidating, but really it's quite simple if we break it down. So, if we take one of the world's favourite atoms, oxygen, and its electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. What we're looking at there is the shell and the subshell and the number of electrons hosted within that. So oxygen has eight electrons. So if we use the gray arrows, we can highlight where oxygen exists on this chart. So we do 1s2 for the two electrons hosted in the s orbital, 2s2, and then 2p4. And that means we still have two spaces left on that p orbital. So looking at a particular atom in the periodic table, now we're looking at gold, a favourite of geologists. In the middle, we usually have the symbol and sometimes the name. So gold has a symbol of AU, which is derived from the Latin for gold, which is aurum, not geo, as some might expect. We usually have the atomic number, which is also sometimes known as the proton number. Now this represents the number of those positively charged protons in the nucleus. Then we have the atomic weight or the atomic mass, which is the mass of an atom. So it's the collective weight of the nucleus of that atom. Okay. And then sometimes we also have the electron configuration, as we've just learnt. In this case, we have xenon in squared brackets before the electron configuration. That is essentially shorthand for the electron configuration of xenon. Otherwise, this electron configuration would go on and on and on and would not fit onto a page. Okay, so it's a simple way of, of shorthand writing the electron configuration. Other things that we should know is that things like isotopes and ions exist. So we have isotopes, which represent the same element with the same number of protons, but have a different number of neutrons, and therefore it has a different atomic mass. So for example, if gold, we're looking at an isotope of gold, not if there is one, but for example, this atomic mass would change whilst this atomic number does not. Okay. 
We also have things known as ions. Now, ions are an atom that is either positively charged or negatively charged. Positively charged atoms are referred to as cations, and negatively charged ions are referred to as anions. Okay, this is due to either electron loss or electron gain. So, a less causing a positive cation and a gain causing a negative anion. So now we're looking at the periodic table, okay? We have a range of different colors representing different groups of elements in the periodic table, and we're gonna look at this in a moment. Just to give a brief outline, so over here we have what's known as the S block. So these are elements um, that their outer electron, also known as their valence electron, exists in the S subshell. Then we have the D in the D subshell, the P block, the P subshell, and then F down here in the in the lanthanides and the actinides. Okay. So across the top we have what's known as groups. Okay. So that represents essentially the columns of the periodic table. Now these groups are all elements that have the same number of electrons in their outer shell. So they have the same number of valence electrons. And then down the side we have what's known as periods. So you have the first, second, third, fourth period. Now these are elements that have the same number of shells. Okay, different number of electrons in those shells. Okay. So just to subdivide this, in a moment we're going to just split apart this periodic table and look at the different groups and some of their basic properties. Okay. So firstly we have what's known as the non-metals. In this case we're excluding halogens and noble gases. So these are essentially gaseous phases, you know, like oxygen, carbon, nitrogen. They have high ionization, ionization energies, they're oxidizing agents, low densities. These are our non-metals. We have our alkali metals in group one. Now these typically have low melting and boiling points, low densities. They have one valence electron. In the next group or column, we have what's known as alkali earth metals. So these also have low melting boiling points and low densities, but now they have two valence electrons. Here is the transition metals or D block elements, okay, which represent the groups three to 12. Now these are conductive, these are ductile malleable elements and they often possess many different oxidation states. And then we have what's known as basic and base metals. These are metals that are abundant in nature and possess many oxidation states or there's many ions. In geological terminology, base metals includes things such as nickel, copper, zinc and lead. Next, we have what's known as semi-metals or metalloids. Now, the properties of these element, elements are essentially intermediary between metals and non-metals, hence their name. Okay, These often form alloys with other metals, and they generally have generally good semiconductors. And then we have the halogens in group 17. Now, these are reactive non-metals. They're highly reactive because of their valence electron configuration. They have essentially one electron missing from the outermost shell, which makes them highly reactive highly electronegative. Then we have the noble gases in group 18. So these are called noble because they're very non-reactive, okay? They're stable because their outer electron shell has the maximum number of electrons possible. They also have very low melting and boiling points. So usually configured underneath the periodic table is the lanthanides. Now these are a group of rare earth elements that all have fairly similar properties. They're referred to as the lanthanides because they all have similar properties to the starting element in this row, which is lanthanum. Okay? These all form essentially trivalent cations, with some exceptions that we'll discuss in future lessons. And these are all quite reactive elements. And then just underneath the lanthanides, we have what's known as the actinides. Now, this is a very interesting row, because only two of these elements actually occur in nature. The rest are synth synthetic. Okay? That in the ones that occur in nature thorium and uranium. Okay, These are reactive and again just like the lanthanides they refer to actinides because all their properties are similar to the element in the first slot which is actinium. Okay so now we're going to look at it from a slightly different perspective and now we're going to look at it a bit more from a geochemical perspective. Firstly we have what's known as the large iron lithophile elements sometimes abbreviated to L-I-L-E. Now these are elements that are generally incompatible and have a small charge to ionic radius. Next, we have what's known as the high field strength elements, abbreviated sometimes the HFSE. Now these are elements with a small ionic radius and a high charge, and with that high charge comes a high associated electric field, which then refers to their name, 
high field. Now these are all trivalent and tetravalent ions essentially. And lastly, an interesting one is the precious noble metals. And then if we just take out gold and silver, so the two in the right column from that equation, we have them what's referred to as the platinum group elements. Okay. Now these are all precious metals that are quite rare in nature and they often occur together in nature due to their similar properties. These elements are particularly resistant to oxidation and corrosion. So now we're going to look a little bit at Goldschmidt's classification. Okay. So Goldschmidt's classification essentially refers to four different groups of elements according to their behaviour in geological systems. Firstly, we have the atmophiles, which are gas-loving elements. So these are essentially volatile elements that exist either at or above Earth's surface. These elements are often either liquid or gas under typical atmospheric conditions. Then we have what's known as the lithophiles, so rock-loving elements or rock-forming elements. Now, these are known as rock-forming elements through readily bonding with oxygen. Now, these elements are typically those that make up Earth's crust as we know it today. Okay, Silica being perhaps one of the most abundant, as well as aluminium. But then we also have what's known as siderophiles, iron-loving elements. So siderophiles, they're mostly transition metals that don't have much of an affinity for oxygen, i.e. they don't want to bond to oxygen so much. These elements are particularly rare in Earth's crust, and that refers to when Earth was being accreted and it was undergoing differentiation, so we have that metallic Earth's core and the mantle, a lot of these elements would rather exist in that metallic core, so they partition towards the core, hence which is where they're enriched, and hence why they're depleted often in Earth's crust. Okay. And then we have what's known as the chalcophiles. Now these are sulphur-loving elements that rather than bonding with oxygen, they'll readily bond with sulphur under crustal conditions. Now I say locally abundant because elements will concentrate in sulphur, and then the sulphur will then accumulate to form what's known as an ore deposit. All deposits are things that we mine for metals today. Thank you for watching. If you found this helpful and you have any questions, please drop a comment. If you want to stay in the loop for future lessons, please help out by clicking subscribe. Thank you.